I'm going to talk about uh, breeding for end user traits. If you have interest or an inclination to work in private industry after you complete your degrees, then, then this will be a lot more pertinent to you than if, if you continue to work in the public sector. Basically, we'll talk about the evolving definition of the customers of plant breeding. We'll talk about the agriculture value chain. And then probably the three most rapidly developing areas of breeding for end user traits fall into biopolymers, biofuels, and this biofarming, which is producing pharmaceutical substances in plant systems. Uh, first, I'll, I'll borrow from a friend of mine in Pioneer, where Pioneer Seed Company, or DuPont Pioneer Seed Company today, are sort of looking at changes in their customer base. Traditionally, they've served the grower or the farmer who's interested in both their seed and their crop protection products. But more and more in today's world, they're also looking at what they call end-user customers, people that are asking for grains with specific characteristics or traits for a specific end-use. And this is a very simplistic view of end-user customers, but uh, at least the basics of this are correct. The products that are developed must first meet the grower needs or the farmer needs, and that they must have the yield, the agronomic characteristics, and the farmers must have a choice. Different maturities, different disease insect resistances, different biotechnology traits. <clears throat> The grain end users, though, also would like to have improved characteristics in these varieties. They must have a consistent and high volume supply of those new varieties. And always, the customer, whether it's the farmer or the, the end user, must have that choice. And you can see uh, DuPont and Pioneer's view is that biotechnology is necessary to achieve both of these objectives. And by and large, it is as we get more complicated on what the end user objectives and requirements are. So to continue with what Pioneer is working on, they're looking at output traits, that they're saying these output traits coming through biotechnology will soon take center stage away from the agronomic traits, herbicide tolerance and BT, and some virus resistances. And that in fact, those traits will move towards feed nutrition since 75% of the grain that we produce, at least in the US, is fed, and will move towards corn processing since 25% of the grain is processed. That when you're looking for targets in this areas of nutrition, looking at increased energy improve protein quality, <clears throat> better phosphorus availability. The, these traits, as you might guess, are our targets are somewhat conditioned by traits that Pioneer has in-house that they're working on. So they're looking at high oil, high lysine, and low phytate corn. Corn with a lower level of uh, phytic acid, which doesn't bind as much phosphorus and makes phosphorus more available to the plant. And they're looking at the potential impact of this on meat quality. They're looking at meat quality because this by and large excludes dairy cattle. Uh, they have a, another large program going for silage corn development for dairy. So they're looking primarily for beef production in cows but more importantly, for production of pigs and chickens. In terms of processors, they're looking at likely targets being corn wet milling, our high fructose corn syrup example, uh, where they want increased starch recovery and some oil modification. The oil modification being necessary because this high fructose corn syrup industry is somewhat of a misnomer. When you're dealing with corn wet milling, 
it's hard to tell what is the end product and what are the byproducts because the price for the high fructose corn syrup varies from year to year and sometimes sort of the dregs that are left over that contain the protein and the cellulose and are sold as animal feed supplements are worth more than, than the, the real products. So that's why the oil modification is in there. And then uh, ethanol production, which we'll talk about uh, more extensively later. So what has Pioneer done to date? For corn wet milling, they have 28 products that have 2% higher starch yields. They have 12 products with higher amylopectin versus amylose in the starch. They have 50 products that have up to 4% greater ethanol yield. They have high energy corn, enhanced nutrient digestibility available in 30 hybrid products. And in food corn, for food grade yellows, they have 33 products and whites, eight. Yeah, that's to standard commodity number two yellow dent corn. So that uh, the normal varieties that have been produced historically, they are selecting for higher starch content. Now I'll tell you in just a few minutes, um, a lot of these targets are not very meaningful to the customers who use this. And Pioneer and DuPont ha have a major problem in that they are biotech and seed companies and they partner with some grain handlers but they don't really have the partnerships in place yet with the processors and then so we'll talk in a few minutes about the value chain and and the impact that other things than increased starch content in the variety other competitors uh, other options so here's a sort of a composite slide looking at the four major companies that are at least creating a lot of publicity about end user traits. Renesson, which is a joint venture of Monsanto and Cargill, working on various traits for corn, increase acid, amino acids, processor preferred, and they don't say exactly why. Soy, the same thing, process of preferred modified oils, amino acids, canola, cotton. Syngenta, working on corn that's processor friendly. And then working on melons that are more personalized for their European businesses. DuPont, in partnership with Bungie, looking at increased energy, amino acids, high extractable starch, again. And white corn, soybean, oils are important amino acids important in meal quality, sunflowers all for oils, BASF looking for corn with increased nutrient density. Uh, BASF also is working a lot on potatoes and, and uh, rapeseed and other crops. All right, so some of the products that uh, are expected to be important and in fact some that are sort of coming out of the product pipeline is this debate between saturated versus trans partially unsaturated oils and pointing out, you know, originally our nutritionists and medical profession told us that saturated fats are bad. Don't eat saturated fats, eat unsaturated fats as much as possible and that therefore uh, we went into a whole series of products that utilized a chemical technology to desaturate saturated fats. Well, then we learned that that chemical technique produces trans unsaturated fats, which is nothing more than the position of the hydroxyl and hydrogen ions on the carbon chain. The natural condition is the cis position and chemical hydrogenation results in trans fats. Well, it turns out now that trans fats are probably worse for us than saturated fats. 
And so now there's a lot of clamor about producing trans fat free products. And so this is an example of how you do that with soy oil. The saturated fats in blue, the combination of looking at soybean oil versus various unsaturated fatty acids, canola corn, and the biotech oil having the lowest percent of saturated, and of course, within soybean, what we would do is chemically hydrogenate the oil, and we would result in a lot of trans fats. And, and so the development here by Monsanto is to get a cooking oil that uh, compared to the normal oil, conventional oil, is much lower in both trans fats and saturated fats, and therefore much healthier. So Monsanto is to be applauded, uh, applauded because they're really concerned about consumer health. Well, actually, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Frito-Lay and all of the people that use vast quantities of oils to fry foods, they really care about the fact that their oils are not very nutritious for us. But if they can't make money with a new product, they're not willing to switch to a more expensive product and lose money. So luckily it turns out that these lower trans and lower saturated oil products happen to be more stable. So their shelf life is longer and McDonald's can fry a lot more french fries in the same amount of oil before they have to dump it out and put in fresh oil. And so the processors then say, okay, well we could pay if the oil lasts that much longer and we use that much less oil, then we can pay you that much more money for that type of oil and still make a profit. So, Monsanto and Cargill have come out with a brand of Vistiv soybean oil. First commercial production in 2005. Basically, it's a low linolenic oil. 3% linolenic acid versus 8. That gives less trans fats. It's healthier, but the key here, it's a more stable oil. Well, that was 2005. The next year, DuPont and Mungi came out with their low linolenic soybean oil, their Nutrium brand. Basically, for frying oil, spray oil, and bakery products, and basically, somewhere in here, it should say here, higher natural stability and increased shelf life, also longer frying life. Following along that line, Procter & Gamble and Bungie, with some technology that they're trying to induce DuPont to contribute, are saying, okay, phytosterol is, is very good. It reduces cholesterol in our bodies, and so it's used in pharmaceutical uses, in margarines and spreads, and soon to be in juices. And so again, an improvement in oils is very, very important. Unfortunately, there's not really commercial application of this oil yet because there's not really a commercial driver in terms of more stability or longer frying life. So it'll be interesting to see how long before these uh, high phytosterol materials come through. And point out then, this is just uh, the premiums as of 2004 on specialty corn with, with all of the emphasis on, uh, I should have put this two slides earlier, three earlier, all of Pioneer's emphasis on improving corns for end user production, you can see that the highest premium for specialty corns in Illinois in 2004 was for identity preserved non-GMO oils, or our corn grain. So high oil brought in 17% premium, and yellow food grade corn brought in a 20% premium. But by and large, at the farmer grower level, 
uh, and at the elevator green collector level, by 2004, the, the only trait or the major trait that people would pay for is non-GMO oils. Well, subsequently, that's changed. Uh, there's not as much demand for non-GMO oils once the Starlink corn controversy sort of faded. Uh, and there are, in fact, now some increased emphasis, at least in the waxy. And I don't know if we have it on here, but some of the high extractable starch corns for ethanol. So is there value in adding uh, traits that the end users or the consumers would use? Yeah, I mean, that's been recognized for years. What these little graphs show is the green part of the graph is the cost of the raw materials. The yellow are the internal cost for that stage of, of its production, and the red is the margin. So as you can see down here, the seed company <laughs> looks like just a flat line. Very little cost of, of their raw materials, very little internal cost, and almost no margin. So that if we started out with a one ton of wheat for $100 at the farmer's level, the seed company might make $6 on that ton of wheat. <clears throat> the ag chem company might make $34 from what the farmer will pay for chemicals to produce that ton of wheat. Of course, the farmer would make $100 because that's what our, our starting point of basis for this graph is. But look down beyond the farmer. The grain trader would make $120 off of that ton of wheat. The miller would make $200 off that ton of wheat. The baker would make $1,000 off of that ton of wheat. And the retail supermarkets selling to consumers would make $1,200. <clears throat> so is there value in putting traits into the crops here? that give more desirable and more income down here? Yeah. Lots, lots of value. And here's similar things for soybean and high fructose corn syrup into beverages. As you can see, the grower gets one time the value, the processor 1.2 times, the manufacturer 12 times, the retailer 15 times. High fructose corn syrup, the grower one time, the processor three times, the manufacturer 18 times, the retailer 65 times. Manufacturer here would be Coca-Cola and PepsiCo and uh, Budweiser and Coors and all the, the breweries. Uh, the retailers would be the people that sell it in, in the supermarkets or stores. So DuPont, with their uh, partnership with Bungie, and when their purchase of Pioneer Seed are moving from input providers, corn, soybean, and other seeds, through providing the chemistry, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, through the growers down to the grain processors, they have a big business on soybean protein applications. And so they, they are quite useful in helping McDonald's produce hamburgers with lower beef content and more soy protein content. Um, through their Bungie Biotech operation to provide the low linolenic, higher quality oils products through their Food and Nutrition Act deal to serve both food and nutrition markets and the health science markets. So everybody recognizes the value of, of uh, sort of moving down this chain and the margins on this end of the chain are quite significant. The problem is that a lot of the people at this end of the chain, the seed companies and the biotech companies and the ag chemical companies who would need to do the research and development to produce products that meet these in-use requirements are saying, well, but if I put in all this money to develop this product, how do I get the guys on this end of the chain to share those increased profits? 
So what people are finding out, some people have already found, others are still finding out, this value chain is very, very complex. It's hard to capture that value downstream. I mean, everyone would like to say that, sure, if you can give me a better product, I'll pay you part of what that product is worth. Identity preservation is required to get all of these products through that chain, and that's very expensive. <clears throat> the biotech companies realize very early in this process that just developing the traits is not enough. If you don't have elite crop genetics, the, the program goes nowhere. Why? Because this whole model is based on the farmer producing 120 bushels of corn per acre year after year after year. And if the farmer doesn't have elite genetics to do this, and your new variety with a trade in it yields half of that, or 80% of that, you just aren't competitive. And the substitution potential really knocks a lot of these products out of the water. So actually that little simplistic uh, model that uh, we had before with DuPont and Bungie sort of breaks down into uh, three input suppliers, the seeds, the chemicals, and the traits, primarily the biotech traits. So the seed, the ag chemical, and the bio plant biotechnology companies all here, they first must provide and meet the needs of the growers. That's why the elite genetics is necessary. Then they have to move this through the elevators and the processors. And if it's a specialty trait that requires identity preservation, there's problems here with the growers, here with the elevators, in order to get those traits in their pure form to the processors. But then it sort of splits because you have certain needs and certain customers interested in food processing through retailers to bring to the consumer and others interested in feed processing to develop food from chickens, pigs, and cows to take to the consumers. Identity preservation, why is it expensive? Farmers have to use pure seed. The seed that you plant must, be a, must contain that trait in 100% of the plants. You've got to use clean planters and combines. You can't have any mixed seed from other batches that you're planting go in have to avoid pollen drift. Then you have to avoid commingling of your specialty seed during your harvest, drying, storage, and transporting operations. The grain buyers must avoid commingling during receiving, drying, storage, outloading, and transport. They need multiple bins or elevators to handle different products and they incur extra cost in terms of training their people to identify, monitor, and keep separate all of those products. So the identity preservation shoots most of these specialty products out of the market before they get started. And I worked for Cargill at the time that this was really a hot topic, and the general perception was that Cargill was against GMO crops because identity preservation would be a problem, when actually it was just the opposite. Cargo says, oh, no, 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 no. We don't favor, and we're not against GMO crops, but if, in fact, identity preservation is what makes them work, we're very happy, because we can preserve the identity from the farm to the final user, and we can make about 10 to 20 times more profit doing that, because it's so much more expensive. And so they'd very much like to be able to do identity preservation and for years have done identity preservation for the Japanese on special soybean varieties for uh, miso type production for soybeans. Crop genetics are essential. This is Pioneer's germplasm as it goes from the 30s to the 50s up to 95 to 2000. And it just shows the complexity and the amount of proprietary germplasm. I talked about all of these heterotic patterns and 
complex interactions, heterotic groups. I mean, this, this is a very valuable source of material. Extremely valuable. Impossible today for anyone else to create this value very rapidly at any expense. I mean, this is all based on 70 years, almost 80 years of breeding and development of an elite stream of genetics. So extremely valuable. In fact, in the mid-90s, there was sort of a run on chemical companies or biotech companies buying seed companies. The value of those seed companies was number one in its elite genetics, number two in the plant breeders that they employed who could continue to develop those elite genetics. Now admittedly with Pioneer, DuPont credited a little bit of the value of Pioneer to their extensive network of farmer dealers because Pioneer was the only seed company in the world that had farmer dealers who were sort of quasi employees of the company and, and had sort of their own build-in distribution. All of the rest of the seed companies had only the research and development and the production capabilities and utilized sort of volunteer farmer dealers who would sign up and could change from company to company on a year-to-year -year basis if they liked to. So what was the value? Well, DuPont paid $9.4 billion for Pioneer's business. Monsanto paid $220 million for Asgro, $1.2 billion for Holdens, $3.7 billion for DeKalb, and $1.4 billion for Cargill's international seed business their non-U.S. business, which was only about 70% of the Cargill seed business. So the value of the elite genetics really drove the companies who wanted to move down that value chain into some very expensive purchases of genetics and breeders who could continue to produce it. Even having done that, though, a lot of these companies didn't realize the impact of the substitution potential. For instance, if you were going to develop a low trans fat soybean product, which Monsanto has done and is marketing with Cargill, you can lower the level of trans fats in a new soybean variety. But in general, year after year, over different environments, you can find soybean oil produced with different levels of the various fatty acids. And so you can find some natural environmental variation for soybeans with less saturated fats, which means less fats that have to be dehydrogenated, which means less trans fats. So actually, farmers can sort of do their own sampling and come up with lower trans fatty acids, or at least processors can select from different parts of the country in different seasons and come up with lower trans fats, or processors can say, well, we don't have to have soybean oil to get lower trans fats. We can use sunflower or canola oil. Or food manufacturers can say, well, we've traditionally based this product on soybean oil, but we can change the recipe for our products that we're producing. And all of these things can happen based on what? Why would you make any of these changes? Cost. Cost. If you're producing millions of tons of oil for frying french fries, you go to whatever is the cheapest source that can get the oil that meets your specs. And to, to be on the plant breeding end, to think you're going to drive the processing industry to use your new 
low trans fat variety. I mean, I've never been more deflated than my first session with Cargill's oil processing and corn wet milling people after explaining to them all of the wonders we could do in plant breeding to provide them with new varieties and having their engineers literally chop me into little pieces by saying, well, boy, we won't pay 50 cents for a ton. We won't pay 50 cents more a ton for that. What do you mean you're going to try to sell that bag of seed for $20 a bag? You can maybe sell it for 25 cents a bag more, and then you can, we, we might pay for the product. So the substitution potential has shot down most of these attempts to, to transfer down the value chain. All right, agribusiness and the food chain. I just put this up to show the various types. So what was really driving a lot of the mergers and acquisitions in the 90s that, that resulted in change were really the fact that these people wanted to get closer to these people in terms of bringing value from this end of the chain back into these pockets. So there were a lot of other reasons why there were mergers and acquisitions and changes in life science companies and develop. But the basic reason was the companies that now had the new biotechnology capability and the ability to produce lots of traits wanted to get down and paired up with these people to get value for those traits. Well, did it work very well? No. The first generation of GMO biotech traits got this far, right? They got to the crop inputs to the grower. Why? Because the farmer could say, Roundup tolerant soybeans, yeah, I can grow that and make a profit. BT corn, yeah, I can grow that and make a profit. So yeah, I can see where I can make a profit. So yeah, I'll pay more for those seeds. The quality traits, which don't impact the farmer grower or the seed input people very much, haven't really had much success to date. Now, will that change? Well, yeah, but changing in the areas of bio-produced traits, which commercial successes to date are based primarily not on profitability, but on what? What would you think would drive research and development of biopolymers, biofuels, and biopharmaceuticals? Well, it's being driven a lot by government subsidies. Governments in the U.S. and Western Europe especially saying, well, you know, it's nice if we have conventional non-renewable feedstocks, we process and we produce products. Not only do we have to have more fossil fuels to produce those products year after year after year, but we will live with those products not disintegrating in our environment for year after year after year. Whereas if we had renewable bioresources, we could produce products that often are also biodegradable. And so we can continue this process. And so there's a lot of support and pressure from environmental or green groups on governments to drive this process. And it's good because that uh, certainly provides a mechanism whereby the people who can develop the technology can afford to deploy the technologies. So biopolymers attained from bio-based materials, they're either isolated from plants or animals or, and today most often, are synthesized in, in big uh, fermentation vats using genetically modified microorganisms. Examples range all sorts of plastics, uh, paint products, lignans, tannins. 
The rationale, fossil fuels are in finite supply, or as people say, $3 a gallon gasoline is under very, very short supply. $4 a gallon gasoline, there's probably a lot more of it. And there's probably a pretty good supply of $5 a gallon gasoline out there today. But still, the fear is fossil fuels are going to run out. Most of the synthetic polym polymers based on those fuels are not biodegradable. And biodegradable poly polymers needed for packaging stuff, consumer goods, medical applications, cosmetics, coatings, and hygiene products. This biofuels to ethanol, it took Cargill a number of years before they would ap approve their corn wet milling business entry into the ethanol market because they did not think the government subsidies on ethanol production would continue. And uh, once they went through a, an election year and found out that the new government in fact was going to continue subsidies, Cargill jumped in. Basically, you take the products from plants, you mix them with water, you grind them in a slurry tank, you add various types of fermentation enzymes, end up by fermenting with yeast to develop the alcohol, recover the alcohol, and then get all of the cell wall protein remnant stuff down here, which goes off into animal feed. Initially, the process worked. It cost more money and more fossil fuel to produce a gallon of ethanol than the gallon of methanol was worth. So we weren't really saving fossil fuels and we weren't really saving any money, but we were producing a gasoline product that had cleaner emissions and was better for the environment. Again, Renaissance, Cargill and Monsanto have worked on new fractionation technology where basically they can go through and pull out and the Cargill, you have to give them credit, they are masters at coming up with one, two, three, four, five different products out of a process rather than one so that depending on economics and substitution potentials and yields of various input products they can usually make money on some combination of those various products. And so by driving this type of model, you can actually produce ethanol today that is economically feasible. It doesn't have a great profit margin, but economically feasible. And you can actually produce it for less fossil fuel than it takes to make it. So is ethanol going to increase? Yeah, you bet it is. Here it goes from 1980 to 2005. Here's the uh, ethanol plants. The red ones are existing plants as of 2000, January 2007. The blue dots, I hope you can see the difference between red and blue. They're almost as many blue as red, are plants that are under construction starting in January 2007. We're looking at significant part of our 2007 corn harvest going into ethanol. The National Corn Growers Association said, don't worry, though. We can do all of this, and we won't short the corn that goes into our domestic uses for feed or other processes, and we won't even short our export because our corn yields are going up every year and we have corn carryover that we can work with. And so, uh, you know, so do they argue that, uh, as we may have seen elsewhere in the world, says we're here to free the people of the Midwest. It has nothing to do with your abundant supply of corn. But trust me, the value of corn is moving up substantially, substantial enough that, that our uh, national defense systems will start thinking about more value. Unfortunately, it's also moving up in value enough that soybean production in the U.S. is decreasing, if not disappearing, and we're sort of ceding soybean production to the Brazilians, which could have some long-term implications that, that uh, we don't seem to be thinking about. All right, one final topic. 
Biofarming is just growing these things for drugs, antibodies, proteins. Basically, you introduce genes in the field crops. You don't need a new production system. The producer can use traditional growing strategies. The cost, if you're using animal systems, between $1,000 and $5,000 per gram of protein produced. If you're using a plant system, between $1 and $10 per gram of protein produced. Lots of economic value in driving this system through plants. Who's doing this? You can look over this. See the crops, tobacco's easy, corn, corn, alfalfa, corn, potato, rapeseed, corn, safflower, and probably corn down with syngenta. Why corn? We can produce a lot of corn very cheaply. Edible vaccines, a very simple concept. It has been tested. It has been given regulatory approval in, in a couple of cases, and it works. You Basically, the costs are very, very low, and the vaccines are likely to reach more people in developing countries. You put a protein gene into a plant. Humans eat the plant. The body produces antibodies against that pathogen protein, and therefore you become immunized. Examples of ones developed so far are antibodies for diarrhea, hepatitis B, and measles. One final topic, uh, we talk about all of these substances, good or bad for you, saturated fats, transaturated fats, high fructose corn syrup versus glucose sugars. Well, we know now, and we know through the mapping of the human genome, that uh, we can match some of this up. Certain diets cause severe health risk in certain individuals, and certain diets enhance disease susceptibility. Some people are lactose intolerant, more sensitive to diabetes. Some people more affected by high cholesterol than others. The nutrigenomics people are saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to develop, look at an individual's genetic makeup, and determine individuals that are sensitive to refined sugars, dairy products, or fatty foods, and that basically we're going to fingerprint everybody and find out what types, who has certain types of enzymes that could give you a problem with certain products, and then we're going to develop your diet so that you should not come into contact with those products. It's a little bit scary, isn't it? I mean, here we're going to get refined to the point you know, it scares me because my diet is primarily buffalo wings and beer. And, and to try to get to where they're going to, to refine my diet to the point that you can or can't eat this or that or the other because your genetic makeup says this is bad for you. But the underlying principle is we're learning more and more about all of these health precautions that the individual genetic makeup of you probably has more to do with your potential for any of these diet-related diseases than your diet does. And I love the commercial about cholesterol now that says, you know, your cholesterol could come from eating all that fatty stuff or from your Uncle Gus or, you know, or your Grandpa Pete or whatever. And, and, and that's the point. Um, all right, so I'll stop there. If you're